Hello, um, welcome to this final webinar of this series for uh, this kind of academic year for, for Coventry University's geography webinar series. Um, certainly last, but by no means least, we've got uh, my, my fantastic colleague, John Dale, um, who's gonna be talking a bit about coastal management, past, present, and future. Before I hand over to John and leave you in his capable hands, um, I wanted to obviously apologize. Not, we've been really enjoying doing these live, having a bit of interaction, but unfortunately, um, uh, technology has transpired against us a bit and we, we're unable to get that, the link between Zoom and YouTube working. So we've had to do a bit of pre-record, um, but obviously John's got his email address on here. So feel free to send him any, any questions, bombard him any questions. Um, if, if there is any other, anything that you, you, you are interested in that we've not covered today, I suppose. Um, please keep an eye out on our social media platforms. We will be doing a few things between now and when we restart again. So we're going to um, probably kick off with some more in, in se September, October time. Um, but we are likely to maybe do a couple of things. Um, we've got a few irons in the fire um, that we'd quite like to do over the summer. So keep an eye on Twitter, the Coventry and Cov Uni Jog, Twitter handle or Instagram, um, or follow me on Twitter as well. I'll be putting quite a lot of that stuff up as well. So please keep an eye on it. Um, and if you want to be added to the mailing list, any teachers, give me a shout. So uh, craig.lashford at coventry.ac.uk. I think that's most of the admin stuff over anyway. Um, I'm gonna, I, I'll hand you over to John in a second, but I think nice introduction. So John's been at Coventry now for, for 18 months, I think, John, is that right? I uh, no, uh, well, about that, yeah. Yeah, just thinking, yeah, it is, yeah. So, and he's a lecturer in physical geography, um, man with many hats, many talents, so a bit of GIS, remote sensing, but his real passion and work is, is along coastal margins and coastal management. Uh, his PhD, uh, which was from the University of Brighton, is in the evolution of the sediment regime in a newly inundated coastal, coastal managed alignment site. I can never get a title correct. I tried Tom's last week and made a complete mouthful of it. Um, so sorry for that there, John. But yeah, so really looking at kind of coastal flooding and how we can deal with that. And that's the kind of background that he brings into quite a bit of his teaching, particularly the module that he and I teach actually together. Um, so I think I'm going to stop waffling on and hand it over to you, John. I'll come up and we'll have a few bit of Q&A at the end. But yeah, over to you. Go, John. OK, well, thank you, Craig. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, so as Craig said, uh, I am uh, John Dale, Dr. Jonathan Dale, and I am uh, a coastal and estuarine scientist. Uh, and particularly what I focus on is coastal geomorphology. So by that, we mean geo, so the earth, uh, and morphology, so shape, looking at landforms and how they change and the processes that drive those changes. Just before I go into the, the main part of my talk today, I just want to talk quickly about some of the key techniques and methods that I use uh, within my research, but then also I bring into my teaching. So I use a range of different methods. As Craig mentioned, uh, I use various uh, remote sensing and surveying techniques, which we can see on the right here. So this is um, a, a differential GPS. Uh, which measures using uh, GPS and other navigation systems. It tells you exactly where you are to within uh, a two centimeter accuracy. So if you're using a standard GPS, so something that uh, you have on your phone or your, your car sat nav, then you're probably only, uh, it's only accurate to about five meters. This uses a range of, of different satellites and uh, different, uh, differential techniques to work out exactly where it is to within two centimeters. It also gives you elevation as well. So for geomorphologists, this is key. I can look at how elevation changes to, to a higher level of accuracy. Uh, but also within this, I, I use drones and UAVs uh, to, to look at, I use it particularly for looking at morphological change. So take repeat drone surveys, uh, use the images that are collected to reconstruct the elevation and then look at change that way. But I also use a series of field and lab techniques. I've got a couple of examples here. So uh, profiling and, and surveying the water column to look at um, how 
salinity changes with depth, how to spend the sediment changes with depth. And also you can even look at things like temperature to look at uh, where the water is coming from and the processes that are operating within the water, mainly within an estuarine environment. But then also looking at, at sediment property, sediment strength, and, and not just on the surface, but taking sediment course to look below the surface and see how things have changed with time. So that's a very quick introduction to me. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today is a little bit about coastal management more generally. And I want to start with this image. Now, this is a satellite image of, of Europe. And the first thing that you, well, hopefully you notice are the lights. And what the lights do is they provide a really nice outline of the coastline of Europe. And this is, there's no sort of uh, uh, photogrammetry um, techniques here. This is just a, a pure satellite image. And what this indicates is there are so many people that live in the coastal zone. We can see the outline of the coast just based on, on the lights from people living there. And that's quite fascinating when, when you think about it, that we have, we have all these people living within within the coastal zone. In fact, um, if we just put some numbers to that, globally there is, there is um, just over 1.5 million kilometers of coastline globally. But in 2007, it was estimated that 3.1 billion people live in the coast. Um, and to put that, that into perspective, that is 1,896 people per kilometer. That's a massive amount of people. And that number is only increasing. Um, in fact, between 1990 and 2002, so a couple of years ago, uh, we saw the number of people that lived within 100 kilometers of the coast more than double. It went up from 1.2 billion to 2.5 billion. We love to live at the coast. And that's a trend that's only going to continue as, as more people try to, to live within this coastal margin. Uh, and these figures just represent that uh, in a schematic form, showing the number of people living uh, with distance from the coast and elevation from the coast. The key take home message here is there are a lot of people living within the coastal zone. In fact, there are, there are uh, 136 coastal port cities with a population over 1 million on the coast, and these, these dots here represent them. If you think of any major city, the chances are it is located on the coast. I need to think about the reasons for that. Before we do that though, just quickly, there's, there's more infrastructure on the coast. We've got nuclear power stations and we can think about some of the issues associated with that. So uh, this is the, the famous uh, incident that happened at Fukushima. There are these infrastructure that are being developed at the coast because of the the people living there, that's something that's only going to continue, but there are coastal hazards associated with it. In this case, it was the tsunami. Airports, 11% of the world's airports are located in the coastal zone. That's, that's 1,803. There is so much infrastructure located at the coast. And that's, the, that's something I can't stress enough, just to, to lay the foundations to what I'm going to be talking about today. That puts a lot of pressure, a lot of strain on the coastal zone. And that has impacts, some of which are positive, but there are also some that are negative. So why, why do we love the coast? Why is there so much infrastructure? Why are there so many people? Well, first of all, we like to go on holiday there. 
I'm sure everyone watching this will have will have been on a coastal holiday either for a day for a week maybe for longer and this is uh, an example from well almost a year ago uh, at, at Bournemouth Beach and as soon as uh, lockdown restrictions were lifted everyone went to the beach okay the weather was, was nice much nicer than it is uh, at the minute currently um, but that was everyone's first thoughts it was like right we can go out where we're we going we'll go to the beach and that's something that is inherent within our, our thought process and and clearly as, as we see um, lots of people have the same idea historically though the coast was important for uh, the, the development and, and the establishment of, of humans so this figure shows the the main shipping routes from uh, taken by the Vikings and and way back um, you know, thousands of, of years, a couple of thousand years ago the coast was still of, of high priority and importance because these were the ways that people got around it was how goods were transported it was how people moved around it was key to the the development of the um, and the establishment of, of the civilization and the cultures that we have today. And that's something that still exists. So this now shows the modern day shipping routes taken by, by the large container vessels. And you can see there is a, a key corridor through uh, the Panama Canal and then up across the Atlantic through uh, the English Channel and then up and then round through the um, through the main pathway uh, through the Suez Canal, which of course was in the news recently because of the, the boat that got stuck in there. Um, and the knock-on implications that this has had uh, is phenomenal, just, just one relatively small stretch of water, but it saves vessels having to go all the way around, essentially all the way around Africa. And that, that the impact of that getting blocked had massive implications for for the global trade. The coast is of so much importance, more ways than actually we, we probably think of. Another example that, that's been in the news recently is, is the uh, implications around fishing. Now fishing is, is a, um, a hot topic. It's not something I'm going to go into too much, but I'm sure we all saw uh, the threats made the, towards Jersey that they were going to have their their power turned off by by the French, um, and and the uh, the implications and the the tensions that that caused. Now, fishing is is a controversial topic. It's something that um, a lot of people rely on for their. For their uh, their sort of income, their employment, it's their their well being, and their um, you know, their careers. But there's also the implications of overfishing, and we need to manage stock numbers. We can't take more than more than is sustainable, and that that is one of those key causes of conflicts in this instance. And thinking about how we can protect and how we can maintain fish stocks. And the marine habitat is something that um, that really can't be forgotten when we put all this in context. So that is something that is key: the context to how we manage our coastal environments. And what I'm going to do uh, for the next five minutes or so is just give some examples of of our past approaches to managing the coastal environments and thinking about how that affects where we are today. And I'm going to start off using uh, this example. So this is Southampton. Um, some of you uh, may be from Southampton. Some of you may have been to Southampton, uh, somewhere I used to live, uh, well, several years ago now. Um, but Southampton has experienced a lot of change as a result of the way the coastal environment is used. So this map dates from around uh, 1871. And if we just focus 
on this point just here. So this is the train station. And um, if we were to be there in, in 1871, and you were to be stood on Southampton train station and look to the south, you would see the, the River Test estuary. And this is an area that is, that is intertidal, it's a coastal environment. And if you were stood on the platform, you could look out and you could look out to sea or into the estuary. If you were to go there today, and I've still got the, the train station circled here, what you would see is not the estuary, but actually you'd see Ikea, which is located just here. And you would see the port of Southampton. And this picture on the left here is taken from just about here, looking out towards the, the southeast. This whole area has been reclaimed. We have built out and built out and built out into the estuary for the development of the port, because this is where some of the major cruise liners come in from the UK. This area has been developed and used, as you can see in the picture, there's lots and lots of car parking there for all the people that are going on the cruises. But that's had a massive implication for, for the environment. We've lost areas of intertidal habitat. We've lost areas of, of, of what's well, essentially wetland. That's had changes to the, the hydrodynamics and the, the way the, the water moves in and out of the estuary. So the implications aren't just within a specific area, but those knock-on effects, the changes in the, the flow dynamics is much wider. It's, it's further upstream up the estuary, but also downstream and out, out into the Solent. And this is something that, if we think about it realistically, is going to be very difficult to reverse. We can't just uh, turn this area back to, to how it was in, in 1871. There's so much infrastructure, so much reliance on that infrastructure. But this is something that's going to be very difficult to do something about. So we need to think about what we can do elsewhere to compensate. But this is not the only example of um, of humans changing and influencing the coastal environment. We have built all over the coastal zone. So we have uh, groin fields. Groins were implemented to trap sand and trap sediment to make sure there was a large, healthy beach. But what that has done is that has starved sediment from further along the coast. And that's had negative implications elsewhere. In some locations, we've put concrete on the beach. How is that in any way representative of a natural process or system? But clearly that decision was made for, for some logistical reason that was beneficial to humans. And that's that legacy that we're dealing with. We've got these things, tetrapods, designed to absorb wave energy and act as a, as a buffer during large wave events. We've constructed them and put these, these features in forms of breakwaters and, and other uh, urban infrastructure all the way around the coast. And we have this example here. So this uh, is a, a video taken uh, from, again from the Sodom, from, um, from cows on the Isle of Wight. And we can see the waves breaking over the, the, um, the promenade here. And this is taken not on a particularly uh, windy or rough day. Um, it was taken you know, during quite pleasant conditions. It's just that we have fixed that coastline and now during this happens to be at high water. And that has meant that there is that pressure between a fixed coastal marge, a fixed coastal, um, well, a fixed coastline and the natural hydrodynamic processes. This was something that was uh, particularly uh, prominent at Dawlish um, down in the southwest. So along the coastline here, uh, a railway line was built. It's a fantastic view if you get the train along there. 
Uh, and what, what I do love is that uh, apparently the trains have to be periodically turned around because they get uh, covered in waves on one side and they, they rust faster on the side that's um, exposed to the, the wave activity. So they've got to periodically turn the trains around. Um, but in February 2014, the wall collapsed. And this had massive implications. Um, I know from first hand, I was on a train, not, not in the Southwest, luckily, but I was on a train that day. And the knock on effects uh, were, were um, well, frustrating to say the least. But it's not surprising that this happened. We've got there was a storm event, there was high wave activity, and we've built a wall to try and protect the railway line against that. It was always going to fail. This is something that uh, is, is not untypical for, for the coastal environment. We have built and built and built all over it because we like to be there, because we've got the infrastructure there, because it is important for the way that we live. Just one final example before I move on um, is uh, the beach in Miami. Now, this was the beach. Um, and the owners of these hotels here weren't happy that the, the beach wasn't big enough uh, for the people staying in their hotels. So the decision was made to, um, to extract a load of sand from, from offshore and, and put it on the beach. Happy days. For the hotel owners, they've got massive beaches in front of their hotels. The, the holiday makers are happy, everyone's staying in the hotel. They've got a nice beach to go and to sunbathe on. But from, from a coastal processes perspective, this doesn't make sense. We've extracted sediment from offshore. That's now having a lot of sediment. That sediment isn't meant to be on that beach. Based on the natural processes that are occurring, the beach shouldn't be that big. There's also been um, uh, implications for the the uh, the creatures, the the flora and fauna that lived in that sand. They've been taken from a, a benthic, a, a, a underwater environment, and put on a beach. That's going to have you know they've been uh, dislodged from the home. They're, they're in an environment they don't want to live in. What's the implications for that? And these, as, uh, as coastal and estuarine scientists, as, as coastal managers, these are the questions we're having to deal with. And these are the questions we're becoming more aware of as we move forward. It's now not just how can we protect the railway line? How can we have a nice beach? We're thinking about the bigger picture. How can we protect the ecological environment? How can we develop a, an approach to coastal management that suits all parties and all users of the coastal environment. So to expand on this and to think about how we can take this forward, I'm going to use an example a little closer to home. Uh, I'm going to use London. Now, I bet the majority of you I haven't realized this, but actually, London is on a coastal environment. The Thames, as it flows through central London, is estuarine, and estuaries are where rivers meet the sea with that mixing of saline and fresh water. And to, you know, to most people, they are considered to be a coastal landform. And in fact, uh, the Thames is, is coastal right up to Teddington Weir, which is, is here. Uh, so, so right far, you know, uh, you know, quite far inland, 30 kilometers inland. Uh, well, 30 kilometers up from London, sorry, from London Bridge. So this is an estuarine environment. But we have this legacy of, of protecting London from from flood events. So we uh, can see here, what well, uh, I quite like this has been described as the stratigraphy of coastal flood defences, the different layers 
we've built on top of defenses and built and built and built and topped up uh, as we've dealt with things like uh, an awareness of, of increased storm magnitude and frequency and sea level rise. And we had this, this buildup of defenses implemented because we removed the natural defenses. There were coastal wetlands within the Thames estuary that acted as natural flood storage areas. And they've been removed, they've been built, they've been drained, they've been built on, uh, used for, for urban development. And now we're having to keep on putting concrete on top of concrete on top of concrete. Um, and this was, was carried out until uh, the Thames Barrier was constructed. The Thames Barrier is great. It protects London from, from storm surges. We have floods coming up the estuary, coastal, coastal storm surges. We have all that water, big tides coming up. And that the barrier protects central London from, from those events. But again, this is completely unnatural. We're having to build a wall across a, an estuary to protect it. What's more, that this is, um, you know, the, the barrier is coming to the end of its design lifetime. It's not going to be operational and functional for much longer. We're going to have to come up with another way of protecting London. Do we build another barrier? Do we make the current barrier taller? Or do we try and think of a more natural way of dealing with this issue? When we think about the threats to the coast environment, so far I've talked predominantly about, about the threats caused by storms. The other big one that I'm sure you're all uh, thinking of screaming out to me is, is sea level rise. And yes, sea level rise, is, is a threat, it's a big problem, or is it? Well, if we go back in time, now this figure is slightly confusing because the, the X axis here goes backwards in time. So we have present day on the left here, and we're going backwards in time uh, to uh, just over 400,000 years ago. And what this line, shows is relative sea level, and that is sea level relative to today's sea level. And what we see here is a fall in sea level, a rise in sea level, a fall in sea level, a rise, a fall, a rise, a fall. And each one of these rises and falls in sea level in the order of 120 meters compared to the current levels, is the movement from glacial to interglacial events. So we're currently in an interglacial, interglacial known as the Holocene. If we go to the, the last glacial maximum, sea levels were 120 meters below what they were today. If we go to the, the interglacial before uh, the last glacial maximum, we can actually see that sea levels are about uh, they're about, well, they're, they're, they're about 10 meters above what they are today. During the last interglacial, sea levels were 10 meters higher than current levels. Is sea level, and we're, we're anticipating a, a rise in sea level in the next 100 years in the order of magnitude of one to two meters. But they were 10 meters higher about 130, 140,000 years ago. We then move back into another glacial period. And sea levels again fall to 120 meters below current levels. This fluctuation in sea level is so much more than what we're anticipating because of climate change. Do sea level, does sea level change matter? Are we going to see a change beyond what we've had in the past? Well, just to, to put this in context and just to explain exactly the processes that are operating here, I've just put together a little uh, a schematic to show this. So we have the land and we have the sea. 
And I'm sure we've all learned about the water cycle. We have water that makes its way into the sea and then works its way back around, evaporates and then falls again. Then this is falling on the land in the sea. This is a very, very basic version of the water cycle. And this is the water cycle during an interglacial period. So when we haven't got glaciers or an extended glaciation as we've seen in glacial periods. If we jump to the, to the glacial period, we still have rainfall or maybe it's snowfall and all the water that falls gets stored up in ice on the land. As a result, we have significantly less water making its way into the sea. But at the same time, our, our supply to uh, complete the water cycle is the same. We have the same amount of evaporation. We have the same uh, supply of, of water going around. So the, the amount of water being stored in the sea is depleted. And our sea levels fall. When that ice melts, that water all returns to the sea and our sea levels rise. And that's in the order of 120 meters. What we're seeing, and in fact, here we have that, that melt uh, at the end of the last glacial maximum, our last big glacial period, we can see that we have this 120 meter rise in sea level. All that ice that's on the land is melting and returning to the sea. What the current concern is, is twofold. First of all, we're seeing an accelerated rate of ice melt. So about 5,000 years ago, that rate of, of sea level rise slowed down. Sea levels rose rapidly, relatively rapidly, after the last glacial maximum until about five to 6,000 years ago, and has since slowed down. But we're seeing an accelerated rate of ice melt. The ice that is still on the land is beginning to melt at a faster rate. So that is beginning to accelerate the rate of sea level rise again. We're also seeing this thing called thermal expansion, which I'm not gonna go into too much, but it's essentially that the, the water in the sea is getting warmer. And as I'm sure you're, you're all aware, when things get warm, they expand. That's why if you go over a bridge, you'll see there's always a gap at either end of the bridge to give the bridge expansion room when it gets hot. So we're seeing a, a potential uh, acceleration in the rate of ice melt. Because a common misconception is that you know, since, since the last glacial maximum, since we had this rapid 120 meter rise in sea level, that sea levels haven't been rising. And that technically is incorrect. Since the last glacial maximum, sea levels have been rising. Very slowly, it's not been a rapid rate of rise, but there has still been sea level rise. The, and that's because we're still seeing some ice melt uh, as we moved out of that glacial period. And in fact, if we take, so this is um, a collection of our, our longest records of, um, of sea level, uh, along with some, uh, some satellite data, which is the black line here. Sea levels have risen and have continued to, to rise. What we're concerned about as, as coastal managers isn't that sea levels are rising because they've always been rising. It's that the rate of sea level rise is speeding up. We're seeing an acceleration in the rate of sea level rise. Now this is a little bit of, um, of a um, eye of faith sort of thing. If I plot that, that line there, before the 1940s, 
you would suggest that, that is the trend for sea level rise. But then we see an acceleration. What we're anticipating is that this acceleration isn't going to be linear. It's not going to be a straight line. It's going to continue to get faster and faster and faster as we go on with time because of uh, because of climate change. But there is some uncertainty within these, these predictions. If we look at the data that we have, we can see that actually we have periods of an acceleration, periods of a deceleration, periods actually where the sea level has, has fallen. It's not a straightforward picture. It's not as simple as saying, yes, sea levels have been rising and are going to, go, and are going to continue to rise and they're going to rise at a faster rate. There are lots of complications built into this based on uh, changes in climate, natural variability in climate, and also our understanding. We're limited on where these records are taken. We're limited on how long these records go on for. We don't have necessarily have the availability of data to be confident in these predictions. So as a result, we're making predictions on, on what the future sea level will be, but we have to account for this variability. So as coastal managers, we can try and predict and try and think about what we need to do in the future, how we can protect our coasts from future sea level rise, but we have this uncertainty. We don't know because we haven't got the data yet to be confident in our predictions, but we also don't know what the future is going to be like. Are we going to continue to put the same amount of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere? Are we going to put more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere? Or are we going to try and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions? What impact will that have? Will that slow down? It won't slow down the rate of sea level rise, but it may reduce the extent to which sea level rise accelerates. So as you can appreciate, the current position, the current um, approach to coastal management is one of uncertainty. We don't know what we need to protect for. We don't know how we need to manage the coast going forward. One thing we do know, though, is that we won't be able to use the past to think about the future. And the reason for that is that if we think about the last, at the early Holocene, the end of the last glacial maximum, sea levels were 120 meters below what they are today. That meant that the UK was connected to mainland Europe. There was a land bridge that went from the what is now the uh, now the, the southeast coast that went out and, and joined up mainland Europe. This is the, the southern part of the North, the North Sea. This was a an area uh, which was given the name of Doggerland. There's a famous shallow bit in the North Sea, which is the, the former Dogger Hills. We know that people were living there. Divers have been down and and they have found. Um, evidence of campfires, evidence of tools. People were living in this area. One, uh, a couple of years ago, one unlucky fisherman managed to, to catch a woolly mammoth skull. Animals that lived on land were here. 120 meters of sea level rise, what did they do? They just packed up and moved inland. They followed the sea inland. And that's something that isn't going to be possible throughout the majority of the coastline now because of these implications of sea level rise because of climate change. And one nice example to demonstrate this is salt marshes. Now, salt marshes are uh, a coastal landform that I'm very passionate about. Um, 
they're fantastic. They, they've got a range of um, species that live on them and live in them. And they support a number of key, um, well, key species that are important for, for us as humans. So things like uh, commercial fish species uh, have their nursery grounds in salt marshes. They're also fantastic carbon stores and can absorb a lot of the carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere. They're also sinks for heavy metals and pollutants and they form uh, a natural uh, coastal flood defense. They're under threat because of a thing called coastal screes. So here we have a, a cross shore profile of a marsh. So we've got uh, our lower marsh here, the bit that um, with the sea, low tide water here, so mean high water neaps. So that's how high the tide will get when we have our lowest tidal events. And when we have bigger tides, more of the marsh is inundated. And there's quite clear zones within the marsh that respond to that inundation. So different plant species like have different saline tolerances, different plant species like uh, to be inundated by seawater for different periods of time. Under, let's say, normal circumstances, if we didn't have all the people living at the coast, that whole system would just naturally move inland with, um, with sea level rise. So that the sea level rises and the whole system shifts the species that, that uh, are found in the, the mud flats in the lower marsh move inland, the upper marsh, that also moves inland. The whole system just shifts inland. However, what we've done as humans, we like to build, we like to claim, we like to fix the coastline. We've built sea walls around the majority of our salt marshes. And what that does is that will prevent that inland migration. The area here is upper marsh, it's got a wall behind it, gets squeezed out as it hits that, hits that wall. It can't move inland, the wall fixes the coastline and it prevents that natural inland migration. So we're having a loss of this really, really important habitat type we're not going to have the same level of these things called ecosystem services. We're not going to have the same, um, the same um, protection from, from coastal floods. Actually, these seawalls are going to be put under more pressure. We're not going to have the areas for, for fish to spawn and for their nursery grounds. We're not going to have the possibility for carbon storage and for, for storing heavy metals and other pollutants all because we built a wall. So as coastal managers, we need to think about how we go about dealing with that issue. The other issue we face with sea level rise is the impact of storms. Now it's anticipated that storm magnitude and storm frequency are going to increase. On top of that, we're going to have sea level rise. That means that the baseline is higher. So if this was my house, I'd like to live on the coast, and this is the sea. During a storm event, we've got our waves coming in. Those waves are not going to, to impact me. I'm going to stay dry. There's not going to be any inundation. If we have sea level rise, exactly the same magnitude storm event it's the same storm event, exactly the same process that happens, just the sea level has risen. All of a sudden, I'm not so comfortable. All of a sudden, I'm concerned I'm going to get flooded. So it's, it's going to be stormier. Storms are going to get bigger. Storms are going to be more frequent. But we've raised the baseline as well. And that that potential increase in, uh, in sea level rise and, and the exposure of that 
means that the whole coastal environment is going to be under much more pressure. So what do we do about it? What can we do about it? Well, there are a number of options. We could do nothing. We could say, sorry guys, you got to move. Move inland. Do what the what our ancestors did, those that, that were living on Dogger Bank did. Up sticks, move inland. I mean, those people were nomadic anyway. Um, they uh, our early ancestors would have been much more um, uh, it was easier for them to move. But that is something that we may have to seriously consider doing. We may have to seriously consider moving away from the coast, moving inland because of because of, of sea level rise and, and the impact that's going to have. Alternatively, we could hold the line. We could build bigger seawalls. We could fix the coast even more. Say no. This is where we're going to keep the coast, and we're going to keep the water out. We could advance the line. We could build out to sea. We could extend the land out like, like they did in Southampton. Move the coastline away, move it further out to sea. Or we can retreat. So this is a little bit different to the, the do nothing approach. Rather than just going, we're leaving it. This is being proactive in the retreat. This is thinking about it. This is identifying key infrastructures that we can move inland. This is identifying areas where it is appropriate to move inland. And this is uh, a process. It's a process called managed realignment. It's something that uh, my research tends to focus on. And I've just got um, a video to show you here of a managed realignment site. So hopefully you can all see the sea wall running along here with a hole in it, here, a breach. This was an area where the, the sea wall was allowed to be breached to let the tide in. This area here used to be um, grazing land for, for sheep. It's an area that could they could afford, there's no infrastructure that could be afforded to be inundated by the sea. And what this has done, this has compensated for the loss of intertidal habitat elsewhere through uh, creating these new areas of habitat. But actually, this area used to be intertidal. If I play the video again, hopefully. You can see that outside of the site, there's this large area of salt marsh. And that's what this area used to be. This is another area where humans have reclaimed the intertidal, uh, intertidal zone. This area was reclaimed during the medieval periods, and, and the people living here thought we'd quite like that land for grazing, to graze our, our livestock on. Let's build a wall. In fact, there were several walls built within this site. It was reclaimed. The area was cut off from the sea. It, it drained. In fact, you can see one of those walls running along the site here in the previous attempt. It was built out and built out and built out, just the same as, as, as happened at Southampton, but rather than being used for the port, this area has been used for, uh, for agriculture. But new approaches to coastal management, new ways of thinking, so it's not appropriate to use this area for grazing. We need to make it intertidal. We need that intertidal habitat. We need the area for carbon storage. We need the area for storing pollutants. We need the habitats for, for the fish and for the birds. And this all fits within the current thinking for coastal management, thinking about the system as a whole thinking about what's coming in from the rivers, what's coming in from the sea, 
what is the impact of humans? What stresses are being put on it? Because things like fishing, pollutants, habitat players. What can we do about it? What are the key things we can do to deal with those, those issues? And that's a, an approach in the UK that we've, we've taken through what's known as uh, the, the shoreline management plans. Historically, our, our approach to coastal management was reactive. It was, this area has been flooded, let's protect it. This area has been eroded, let's protect it. But now, and that's had knock-on effects for elsewhere on the coast. Now we're taking an approach of thinking about the, the system as a whole. And we've broken the coast down into what's known as sediment cells. We've identified areas where the erosion, the transportation, and the deposition of, of sediment is constrained. It's areas where material is not moved around or it's not moved outside of them. The theory is that the sediment stays within that cell. So we can manage that cell as a whole and think about all the different processes, all the different drivers, all the different demands, all the different needs, and take an integrated coastal approach to man coastal management. And this has been done through what's known as the shoreline management plans or the SMPs. There are, are documents for, for coastal management in the UK and on this figure, each one of these black lines represents where we have a shoreline management plan in place, where there is a document saying this is how the, this area of coastline needs to be managed. Thinking about all the different drivers of change, all the different users, all the different people that are, are relying on these environments. And that's something that is going to be adopted further in, in the future. And it's something that um, I, as, as a coastal and estuarine scientist, uh, as a geomorphologist, and, and as someone of an interest in coastal management, we've taken a, a proactive approach to thinking about. Um, it's also something we talk about uh, within, within the various geography courses that we have here at Coventry. We need to think about how we protect and enhance the coastal environment for all users and all the inhabitants, all the people that live there and use the coastal zone. So it's that about maintaining and enhancing coastal and marine habitats, working with, with nature to protect against, against uh, hazards such as sea level rise and climate change, hazards such as erosion as well. How can we use, rather than just building a wall, building those groins, building the heavy, hard engineer defences, how can we use natural processes to protect those areas? But it's also about educating and engaging the coastal communities. We talked briefly before about, um, about the conflict around fishing, how that serves people's livelihoods. But it's also, people, it's also the need to, to protect the marine habitats and the coastal um, species, the fish species and other things like marine mammals that, that live in those environments. There needs to be that conversation, there needs to be that engagement, and we need to think about our social skills to engage with local communities and think about how we can come up with an approach to coastal, coastal management that is sustainable and is functional and works for all parties involved. Not just humans, but also the, the ecological and natural environment as well. So that's all from me. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk uh, and if there are any questions then please do get in touch. Perfect John, thank you ever so much. I've got a few questions that have come up as well so have a nice okay. chat about some, some, some bits there. Thank you, that was, that was really really interesting, thank you so much. Um, so I, I suppose first things first, we're talking looking at the future and, and this is something we, we've really kind of touched upon in quite a lot of these webinars. I mean, um, you, um, we both, you know, climate change is such a key part that we teach throughout so much of our degree here, particularly the physical geography degree. But you did, you know, you brought in the human side of things. You know, it's really important from that side. And we bring it into the BA degree as well. And I mean, from my, from my work in, in kind of inland flood management, um, 
how, how do we do it? I suppose the question is, how far do we plan into the future with this? What, you know, the, this, the shoreline management plans you're talking about, how, how, how much, yeah, how far do we have to think about and consider them for? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question um, and one that I don't think there's a right answer to. Um, we don't, we, we're not, we don't have the certainty in our predictions about what's going to happen in the future. And that is uh, obviously one of the major limitations with, with planning for these events. You've got such a, with something like sea level rise, you know, you, we could have 30 centimetres, we could have a you know, one metre 30, one metre 30 centimetres of sea level rise. Um, that planning for that, it makes such a big you know, difference and the extent that you've got to, to go about doing it. Um, what we also need to do is, and this is something that I, I didn't touch upon, but it's something that, um, that is worth considering, is we don't, we need to make sure that what we're doing works. And that is something that at the minute, we don't really have that understanding. That this idea of, of this more holistic um, approach to, to coastal management, thinking about all the different users, not just um, thinking about people, thinking about flora, thinking about fauna, but also thinking about spatial scale. And you know, as geographers, you know, spatial scale is something that, that you know, we, we both go on about quite a lot. Um, how you manage the coast in one location will have impacts elsewhere. So how do you manage the coast to the benefit of everyone? Um, it's something that, that we don't really have an answer for yet. Um, it's it's also and it's also you know targets as well. How do we we need to make sure that what we put in things like the shoreline management plans is achievable? Um, it's measurable. You've got an outcome that you can say yes, I've met that. But you know, often to, to have optimum success, or how do you define success is another question. But you need to have something that you can say yes this has worked and often that's the limitation so one thing that i didn't talk about but and something that that we do um at third year is marine protected areas um which are areas that are designated marine parks that they're, they're set up to protect the the ecology yet those targets are often derived from you know, there needs to be a certain number of species and you can still put pollutants into those environments, you can still fish those environments potentially. Um, so, you know, you're still having a negative impact. Um, yeah, there just seems to be something, it's not one that there is a straightforward answer to, as is the case in most things in geography. I, I was about to say, and, it, and that's the thing, because what we teach and what we study and what we know is all is, is so dynamic. We're, we're here studying about an, an evolving world. And that's why geography is, and you know, we'll both agree, whether it's geography, environmental science, that whole suite of disciplines is for us the best thing you can study because what we can give you is the tools, that knowledge of what can be done. And it's then about, about kind of, you know, you guys people watching this to go out and then implement that in the, in the world, I suppose, because it's such a dynamic, evolving environment, but it's going to be so important in the future because of the things that are changing, because of climate change, because of everything that does in some small capacity, knock on to everything. You've got to think about, you can't just, we can't just take one beach on its own. We've got to, as you say, look at everything in a more holistic idea. And I think Tom touched on that last week, actually, in his talk, whereas you can't look at one river, you've got to look at a catchment. And it's it's very similar. We can apply this to so much of geography. Um, which then, therefore, brings me, I suppose, quite nicely onto my next question. And obviously, we, you know, management retreat is great. If we're looking at London, um, I suppose, what is the option going for? I mean, I, I know that's a bigger question. You know, I'm not expecting you to give me the, the saving answer for, for how do we save London in, in 50 years time? But I suppose, what, what are the possibilities? We can, can we pick up London and leave it? Is, is, that an, is that something that's done elsewhere in the world, just leaving cities maybe? I don't know. Well, I don't know about, about leaving cities, but it actually uh, builds on what we've just been talking about, about an integrated approach. Uh, so one thing that... that um, has been used in Antwerp, where there's been some massive flooding, is um, they've designed flood storage areas, they've re restored part of the, the Schelt estuary, but it's taken this holistic approach. 
So there's been education, there's been uh, the, the new defences and, and the new schemes have been implemented, not just for the, the flood storage, but for the benefit of nature and for the benefit of the local communities. So there are a number of cycle paths that have been built around these new defences, um, which is fantastic because you know, from a well-being point of view and you know, in quite a, an urban and quite industrial area, suddenly people can, can have access to the outdoors, but also from the economy, a lot of people are coming to visit these schemes um, and you know, just to see the, the fantastic work that's been carried out. So the local economy is doing quite well off the back of it. Um, and that is something that I think that's a good model um, going forward. Um, you know, to, to think about how we can, because, you know, we can't, it, logistically, it doesn't work. You can't just pick up London and move it. You can't abandon London. Um, there's, there's so much infrastructure, so much livelihood. People, people won't want to leave. Um, so there needs to be that, you know, that integrated approach. And, and one thing, you know, thinking about the estuary particularly, you've got that sort of, that, um, double effect. You've got what's coming in from the sea, but also what's coming down the river. And, you know, you've got to think about all those different processes. And as physical geographers, that's something, you know, I, I sit here with my, I'm a coastal estuary scientist, you sit there, you're a, a, a river flooding person. Um, we need to have those conversations to understand. But then we also need to speak to our, our human geography colleagues to think about what are the social implications, what are the cultural implications, what's the economic, what's the geopolitical landscape. And that's, that's what makes geography great in my opinion. You need to be so diverse to be able to understand. And yeah, everyone has their, their favorite bit and their speciality, but you need to appreciate how all these bits fit together for it all to make sense. Yeah, I can I completely agree. I think that that's that is very much it. That that, that trying to this, they call it blue green cities in a sense, trying to create this place where where water can work harmoniously among people. I suppose is is a really interesting. Way. So the, the other one of my other bits then, and I suppose it was um, touching on one of you. I, I mentioned you are a man of many hats, so it was kind of touching on something you you showed the pictures of you coring at the start. Um, I suppose could you enlighten some of our, our watchers about how, you, you showed a fantastic graph of, of sea level rise over kind of several thousands of years, kind of 40,000 years or so. And then a few slides later, you had one of tide gauge data. So we, that's fair enough. We, we, go, we know our tide gauges go back about 150 years. How do we know then what happened 40,000 years ago? What, 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 how do we get hold of that information? Okay. Um, so... It's hard because we don't have the data. Um, so we have to use these things called proxies, which are things that are representative of conditions of the past. Uh, and there's, there's various ways we can go about, about doing it. So one way we can go about looking at the past is we can use uh, little creatures that, that live in the sediment. So there's diatoms and there are things called foraminiferas. They're all creatures that, like I showed with the salt marsh um, diagram, there's different zones within, within the intertidal zone. Um, and that zonation, I'm getting lots of zones in here, um, then determines uh, you know, which creatures, just like the, the salt marsh, some creatures like it more saline, some like it more brackish, some like fresh water. And what we can do is we can, we can take a sediment core and we can go through and we can count. Uh, so we look at them under the microscope and we say, okay, so I've got an abundance of, of this species. Um, this species likes saline conditions. We know that it used to be lower in the marsh or low in the environment. Uh, there's there's other ways as well that we can. So that figure I showed had this thing called MIS, marine isotope stages, if not it. And that uses um, it's getting a bit into chemistry, um, but it uses um, the different isotopes of oxygen, and and the ratio of that 
um, to determine whether we're in a, um, a glacial period or, or an interglacial period. Um, I don't want to say too much because it's something that we, we do at first year um, and uh, we have great fun thinking about MIS curves. Yeah, that's what I thought I'd throw out there. It's a nice little teaser of some of the, the, the it's one of my favourite bits of kind of historic, well, well, historical geography has different connotations in it actually in a very human sense, but kind of the quaternary side of things. Um, if anyone is particularly interested in that as well, um, as John mentioned, we teach quite a lot of that first year, but I, I think um, Michelle Farrell, Dr. Michelle Farrell did a, a, her talk very much featured um, looking at uh, different ox oxygen isotope stages. Um, Adrian Woods will have touched a little bit on it as well, and Jason Jordans as well. All three of them will have in some way looked at various elements of proxies um, and how we, we look back uh, and start to use kind of data, his, you know, climate data and to reconstruct past environments. I think that's, uh, I think that's a nice example of how, again, as geographers, we all have, you know, people like Michelle and Adrian and Jason think a lot about the past and they use the past to, in, to inform our understanding of the present. Um, what I do is, is I think about the present and the future, but I, you need that understanding of the past. Um, so again, it, it's a nice way as, as geographers shows how we all sort of connect together and we need to, to rely on each other to, to bring it all together. Very much so. And I think um, what I've really enjoyed, and this, I'm doing this now to tie the whole webinar series, I suppose, back together. And one of the things I've really enjoyed is it's kind of just watching and because we are quite a close team um, in, in geography at Coventry. And um, it was, you know, whether it was me hosting, Charlie hosted, um, Jade a few, Matt a couple, but there is all these links and synergy between everything we teach and they, everything can link together in some capacity. I think we, we, um, we do that really well at Coventry, I, I, I believe anyway, and I, I think you'll agree, John, you know, tying things together and, and um, teaching a whole range of, of topics that fall under this geography suite. Um, whether it be, you know, the very early sessions that we did with Alex with uh, the, the look at EastEnders and the role of place all the way through to today um, and looking at coastal margins with, with a bit of hydrology in between, with a bit of, quite a bit of climate change and some sustainable fashion thrown in as well to give this lovely loop of all of geography. So um, we really do hope uh, you've enjoyed these sessions. Have you got anything else that you wanted to add, John, from, um, from your presentation? Sorry, I should have said what's that one. No, no, just that I think you're exactly right. I, what I love about geography is that one day you can be watching EastEnders, the next you can be waist deep in mud thinking about something, a fossil you can't even see in it. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's, you know, that's what makes geography great. Yeah, and it's one of the things we like to do in our first year trip. We get you to go not just quite EastEnders, but we get to go to Manchester on, on one day doing some human geography. And then exactly as John said, throw you in some mud up in the lakes the following day. Um, <laughs> It's done, it's done nicely. It's not literally thrown oh, in. Yeah, kind of. No, it is. Yeah, just about done nicely. Um, but no, thank you all ever so much for, for engaging with these sessions. I've really enjoyed doing them. Um, if you've got any questions, please look back. You'll find all of our emails. Please send us any emails. We're always happy to hear from people. We're always happy to have uh, more conversations with you. But as I said earlier, keep an eye out on um, our social media platforms. Um, and keep an eye out, speak to your teachers. As soon as we, we uh, firm up anything else in the future, I'll let your teachers know. But really, thank you so much for, for um, watching and engaging with this. We've, like I said, I, I, I've really enjoyed it. I know my colleagues have, have really enjoyed it as well. So we really do hope you have. And um, hopefully we'll see you in, in September when we start our next, next lot of webinars. So thank you all ever so much. And um, yeah, we'll see you soon. That's all.